In this video, you will learn how the earnings power value model works, what companies it works on, and what does it tell you about specific companies. We're going to use Apple as an example, and I'm going to walk you step by step to how you can calculate the earnings power value number. And if you stay till the end, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet that automatically calculates this value for you, as well as a DCF. Now, before I show you the actual spreadsheet where you will be able to see the calculation step by step of the earnings earnings power value model. Let me share with you a few very important key details about this model. So first of all, what is it? The earnings power value model is actually a method of value in a company. And this is the key part, assuming that the current earnings are sustainable and there's no future growth. And we're going to dive deeper into what that means and what kind of companies actually fit this criteria so that the result that you get in terms of the intrinsic value of a company is actually accurate and useful for your investment analysis. The use of this model, it's very simple. It is used to determine if a stock is overvalued, undervalued, or fairly valued. And sometimes this method is used in conjunction with other valuation methods to be able to arrive at more accurate estimates of value. Lastly, this valuation method is best for stable, mature companies with strong moats or otherwise known as competitive advantages that allow them to keep their current market share. To dive deeper into the types of businesses where this valuation model is effective, we have to look at the business life cycle. So as you can see in the business life cycle, there's different stages that companies go through. So first we have the introduction stage, the growth stage, the maturity stage, and the decline stage. And you can see the description and the typical characteristics of each stage. However, for this type of valuation, when it's going to be the most effective is for companies that are in the mature stage. And that's because at this particular moment in time, is when the companies reach a consistent level of sales, they have reduced cost and increased profits. And the good thing about this is that it's gonna make the calculations a lot more accurate on your end and the assumptions that are built into the model are gonna be a lot more relevant versus if you use it on other companies, for example, the ones in the growth stage, where Typically, as you can imagine, there's going to be a whole bunch of growth and expenses related to that. And therefore, the value that you're going to get from this model, it's not going to be very meaningful to making a good investment decision. As you can see, the formula for this valuation method at a high level is very simple. All you have to do is take the adjusted earnings and divide that number by an interest rate, which is typically the WAC. If you think about it, this is very similar to the perpetuity value formula, where you're expected to get a set of cash flows in perpetuity and you discount those cash flows using an interest rate. Now, there's a little bit of nuances involved in being able to calculate the WAC, but most importantly, in this video, we're going to focus and I'm going to take you step by step into how it is that you can calculate the adjusted earnings for any particular company. Okay, so now I'm going to show you step by step using the spreadsheet that I've created how to calculate the earnings power value for Apple. The way it works is simple. The spreadsheet is set up so that it automatically gets um, all this different data like the operating income ratio, the income tax expense, etc. And all of this comes from Y sheets, as you can see, using these formulas so that when you change the company ticker, the data will automatically update. That being said, let me take you step by step into how each of these calculations is done. Okay, so starting with step number one, we have to first find the average EBIT. And EBIT is the same thing as the operating income. And what we're really looking for is the operating income ratio. So using Y sheets, we can see the data here. And what we're looking for is the average. So in this template, you will have for all these different metrics, the average and the median. And it is important that you know when to use each one. So the average is pretty good to use when there's no much deviation, when there's no much of a difference between, between the values. And the median is good to use when there's a huge difference or big outliers in the value. So for example, if we had 29 here and then all of a sudden we had 15, that's going to skew the average a lot versus if we use the median, it would probably be a more accurate number that we would use. The second step 
is to normalize the EBIT or the operating income. So in this case, what we have to do is get the operating income and the income tax expense so that we can calculate the income tax ratio. This tells us on average how much the company is actually spending on tax. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation. In this case, it probably makes more sense to use the median, but for the sake of simplicity in this template, we always use the average. Now, the other thing that you will notice is that for all these different numbers and metrics that we're calculating, we're using five years, and that is usually typically what is done so that you can capture the company's numbers across multiple periods so that there's no much bias in the data. So as you can see, we first calculate the average income tax ratio, and then we get the current level of sales. And in this case, we could use 2021, which is the latest year for Apple right now. But in this case, I decided to use the trailing 12 months, which is the result of the last four quarters of data. So that is a more accurate number because it takes into account all the newest quarters that came out. And then what we do is very simple. We, in order to normalize that number, we take the current number of sales, we will multiply it by what we think the company is going to get in terms of an EBIT margin. And then after that, we take that number and subtract basically what we expect in terms of taxes. And that gives us the after tax normalized EBIT. Before I go into the third step, I just want to say, don't worry, the spreadsheet that you're seeing right now on the screen, as well as the DCF are going to be available so you can download them for free. I'm going to show you how to do that a little bit later in the video. So that way you could follow this process for any companies you like. Okay, so the third step is to add the depreciation. As you can see, we have the depreciation for the past five years. Here we'll get the average and the median. And the way you adjust the depreciation is you basically take 50%. You take 50% times the average tax rate that you calculated here before. And then you multiply that by the average depreciation and amortization expense. And these numbers are likely to give you an accurate estimate of how much the company really needs in terms of its depreciation to keep continuing its business and generate those consistent earnings. After that, what you do is you calculate the normalized profit. And the way you do that is you basically take the after tax normalized EBIT and then you add the adjusted depreciation. So this is what the company would have from a cash flow basis. And the reason why is because depreciation and amortization is not an actual cash expense that the company has to pay. On to the fourth step, we have adding the maintenance capex or calculating the maintenance capex. And the way you do that is very simple. You basically get the capital expenditures and the net income growth for this past five periods or five years. You calculate the average again and you do the same for the net income growth. And what you're going to do is simple. So you take the average capex or the median, whichever one you think is best, and you essentially subtract what you think that will result in terms of the net income growth because of the capex investment that you're making. So you take that value and you multiply by one minus the average net income growth. The fifth step is to calculate gross earnings power value. And the way you do this is very simple. So you basically take the normalized profit that you found by adding the depreciation and amortization to the after tax normalized EBIT. And of course, you're going to subtract the maintenance capex. And the reason why you subtract it is so that it gives you the real cash flow that the company is expected to generate. Remember, to calculate free cash flow, you can take the net income, add the depreciation and amortization, and then of course, subtract your capital expenditures or the investments that you make. And that gives you the true cash flow value of a company. Now that you have this value, it's quite simple what you need to do. So you basically take that value and you divide it by the WAC, which is stated here. Now I'm not going to walk you through how it is that you can calculate the WAC. There's many videos you can watch out there. But if you like, let me know in the comments and uh, I will create a video specifically on how it is that you can calculate the weighted average cost of capital for any particular company. Something that I will tell you is that you can find this value just by Googling the stock name. So for example, Apple and then just the word whack. And there's different sites that do a good job at estimating what the company's weighted average cost of capital is. So after you get this value, you're almost basically done. 
and this is where the last there's six then the last step comes into place so what you do is you take that value and in this case what you're gonna do is add the cash and the short-term investments that the currently that the company currently has because if you were to actually buy the company you would get access to that capital so you have to take that into consideration add it and also you have to subtract the debt so what this is essentially going to give you is the enterprise value of the company after that you take that value and you divide it by the shares the number of shares outstanding that the company has and what that's going to do is turn the value of the entire company into the value per share of the company and as you can see according to this calculations the intrinsic value of apple is 58 as you can imagine, if you change the different assumptions of the model, like using the average instead of the median, changing the weighted average cost of capital, this number would of course be different. So be very mindful of the assumptions that you make. Something else you can do is to get the current share price of the particular company, and then here use this calculation where you basically take this value minus the current price divided by the current price, and it's going to tell you the potential upside and downside. So in this case, based on these calculations, we can find that Apple, according to these numbers, it's overvalued by 65%. So therefore, it's probably not a good idea to invest in Apple just based on this model. However, if you do other models, you might get a complete different answer. So just be mindful of that. And that is why it's important to look across the model that makes the most sense for that particular company and compare that number with what you would get with other models as well. Now, before I show you how to get this spreadsheet for free, what I want to do is share with you some of the key differences between this model and a DCF. Okay, so as you can see, here's a discounted cash flow template where it gets this historical data using Y sheets. But most importantly, based on this data, assumptions are then made in these areas right here. And the assumptions are made to key areas of the different financial statements. So the income statement, the balance sheet as well and the cash flows and then what happens is that based on those assumptions the free cash flow is then projected and with the dcf the key difference is that the free cash flow can be projected to grow or it could be projected to decrease and then based on those cash flows the present value is calculated and that's essentially how you get to the intrinsic value of the particular company whereas for the earnings power value model if we were to project and discount the cash flows, they would be exactly the same year after year. But the key difference is that for a DCF, it's all based on projections. For this model, it's all based on the current numbers. So there's important trade-offs that you have to consider. Okay, so now that you're an expert on the earnings power value model, let's get into how you can get this spreadsheet for free. And it's very simple. All you have to do is download the Y Sheets add-in. And again, this is available on Excel. Create a free account for Y Sheets, log in with your free trial account. And then if you navigate to Wise templates, you'll be able to see the template available there once I upload it, of course. And then the same applies for the DCF. So if you're looking for the DCF template, you can see that it's already available here. You're gonna click on it. It's gonna download and open up a spreadsheet for you. And then from there, you're gonna be able to make any modifications and any changes you like. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell on. So that way you get notified when we create a new video that's going to teach you how to make better stock investment decisions. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.